In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives us the earliest account that we have of what has come to be known as the Lord's Supper, the basis for the modern Eucharist or Mass. Paul's mention of this is occasioned by him berating the Corinthians for their unseemly ways in the conduct of this commemorative meal. Paul, ever the egalitarian, frowns on the proud and self-centred attitude of wealthy church members and their behaviour towards their poorer associates, or brothers and sisters in Christ, as Paul would of course call them. Paul does have a flair for vitriol and his terse comments are always good value, but they're not directly relevant to the argument at hand. This is the section that is starting at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Both the historicist and mythicist camps in this debate claim the passage in support of their positions. Mythicists make much hay out of Paul's statement that he received the story from the Lord, i.e. he got it via revelation. Why would God reveal something to Paul when Paul could confirm it or refute it or simply find it out by picking up the phone to James? Revelations and visions reveal things that are not accessible to the recipient in any other way, either because they predict things in the future, predict actions or statements from enemies who wouldn't reveal them, or are about events in the spiritual realm. And for a prophet to break this rule is simply asking for themselves to be proved wrong. Therefore, so the argument goes, Paul telling us that this information came to him by revelation indicates that the story did not start as history. The historicists say that having a meal indicates a physical existence because ghosts don't eat. That's not totally unreasonable, but Mithras was a strictly mythical figure who probably contributed to the Jesus story, and Mithras is known to have had a weakness for the pleasures of the table. Further, many parents can recognise the phenomenon of ghosts who eat cookies. Historicists also hold that the night he was betrayed, or the night he was taken up as it's sometimes translated, indicate that it happened on earth because according to Revelation 21.25 and 22.5 there is no night in heaven. Mythicists counter this by saying that Paul didn't write Revelation so we can't say that it reflects his views, and further it wasn't written until long after Paul died. And anyway, it's all part of a revelation, the night time bit being revealed as well. And this tells us more about what Paul thought of heaven than it does about what Paul thought of Jesus. It tells us that Paul thought there was night in heaven. I did not include this as a historicising text in my videos on the silence of Paul, but perhaps I should have done, because while on the whole historicists are on the back foot with the silence of Paul argument generally, it is the mythicists who seem to be on the back foot with this question of a celestial night time. After all, day and night were created by a pre-existing God specifically for the earth. But it's not that serious a problem, because the complexities of ancient beliefs about the earth, underworld, firmament, pillars of heaven, ocean of heaven and heaven of heavens gives plenty of potential for heavenly spaces that are subject to day and night. All four Gospels include accounts of the Last Supper. I'll focus on Mark because that is the earliest gospel and the others got their information directly or indirectly from him. So this is Mark's account starting in chapter 14 verse 12. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. 
It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips his bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Paul tells us that his account was revealed to him, and we would infer from that that it originated in his mind, and he didn't get it either in writing or verbally from anybody else. And three key components of this meal that Paul tells us also appear in Mark. Those being betrayal, this is my body, and this is the covenant in my blood. Do ye this in remembrance of me is missing from Mark's account, but the three bits that Mark does pick up are reproduced so accurately by him that they must have come from Paul. Therefore, if we take those three components out of Mark and also take out of Mark anything that is elaborating on those components, we should be left with what Mark got from somewhere else or made up. If that looks like an uninteresting dinner scene that didn't have any particular points to promote its retention in oral tradition, then that would look as though the whole Markian story was made up to fit with Paul rather than Paul's embellishment being added to an existing narrative. So this is what is left when Paul is taken out. So we've got the historicising bit, placing the meal in historical time and geographical space. We've got this strange bit about the man carrying the jar of water, which has led to much speculation that this may be referring to Aquarius. But then we've got this bit at the end. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So the bits that are new to Mark do contain an important point. Important enough, I would think, to drive its retention in oral or earlier written tradition. I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God is interpreted by Christians as having significant theological importance. So it looks to me as though whatever Paul may have thought about the historicity of the Last Supper, Mark had another source for his account, an account that is, of course, thoroughly historicised when compared to Paul's. So Paul's Last Supper is somewhat unusual in that both sides of the argument extract different issues from the same couple of verses. And the issues put by both sides do have merit, but I'm inclined to judge that they have roughly equal merit. So overall I would say these couple of verses are pretty neutral on the matter of historicity versus mythicism.